Uh, my name is Helen Shapiro, and I'm provost of Colleges 9 and 10. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's event. Um, just some history in terms of how our colleges got involved in uh, framing these kind of fora. Uh, since 2004, our co-curricular programs unit has presented debates and roundtable discussions on a variety of controversial topics. These programs have offered a platform where experts with differing opinions uh, have debated topics such as affirmative action, the war in Iraq, abortion rights, marriage equality, animals and research, and military recruitment at public institutions, just to name a few. And the reason why we've organized these events is basically not only to give students a deeper understanding of these important issues, but also to model respectful discourse and show that people can talk across differences no matter how kind of extreme those differences might be. And tonight's forum follows in that spirit. Um, I recognize many of you in the audience, uh, so some of what's been happening uh, is not news to you. But I'd like to kind of review some key events over the past years that have taken place that relate to issues of free speech, academic freedom, and anti-Semitism, particularly relating to discussions about Israel that provide kind of the larger context for tonight's discussion. Uh, some of these events include the following. In June 2009, a UCSC lecturer filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, and that complaint alleged that, and I quote, anti-Israel discourse and behavior in classrooms and at departmentally and college sponsors events at UCSC is tantamount to institutional discrimination against Jewish students, unquote, thereby violating Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. That complaint has been under investigation uh, since, uh, a decision is pending. Uh, similar types of complaints from other campuses, both within and outside of UC, including uh, Berkeley, uh, are also still pending. In July of 2012, last summer, a UC commissioned report titled University of California Jewish Student Campus Climate Fact-Finding Team Report and Recommendations recommended that, quote, UC should push its current harassment and non-discrimination provisions further, clearly define hate speech and its guidelines, and seek opportunities to prohibit hate speech on campus. The president should request that general counsel examine opportunities to develop policies that give campus administrators authority to prohibit such activities on campus. At the same time that that report was issued, also in July of 2012, a UC Commission report on Muslim and Arab student campus climate pointed out that many Arab and Muslim students or those students working with organizations such as the Committee for Justice in Palestine felt that they have been victims of a double standard also and that their First Amendment protected speech and events receive undue attention that borders on harassment. In August of 2012, the California State Assembly passed Resolution HR 35, which, quote, recognizes recent actions by officials of public post-secondary educational institutions in California and calls upon those institutions to increase their efforts to swiftly and unequivocally condemn acts of anti-Semitism on their campuses and to utilize existing resources, such as the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights Working Definition of Anti-Semitism. There are many other events that have happened, both on this campus and elsewhere. Uh, different forms of boycott, sanction, and divestment resolutions vis-a-vis -vis Israel or companies doing business with Israel in the occupied territories have pres been presented to UC student government bodies, which some claim are inherently anti-Semitic and others say are protected political speech. And in fact, a divestment resolution of this type, as well as a counter resolution, were presented to UCSC's Student Union Assembly just two days ago. Uh, in fact, many students right this minute are meeting with their student governments to discuss this. Uh, so the timing in some ways couldn't be better or couldn't be worse. I'm not sure which. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we at College 9 and College 10 have not been untouched by this controversy. Uh, we have sponsored and co-sponsored different programs on these issues over the years. Um, our colleges have been named in some campus complaints about college sponsorship of biased or anti-Semitic events. Uh, we have also been criticized for excessive scrutiny of student-initiated events regarding the Middle East, uh, and also for a mural that, some was, that was deemed by some as being one-sided and offensive. And over time, on this campus and elsewhere, it seems as if the possibility for dialogue on these issues, issues has become more difficult, both on our campuses and elsewhere. Um, many experience 
uh, a climate of fear and intimidation, regardless of their point of view. So tonight, our goal is to engage in civil discourse on these issues, uh, even if it's a small step, but to show that that is indeed possible. Our focus is not about the conflict in the Middle East per se, or the appropriate policy responses here in the region, although that clearly is the context in which this deba debate plays out. Rather, it's about how we talk about these and related issues. What can be said, by whom, under what auspices, on college campuses in particular. Uh, and we want to kind of ask the question whether First Amendment rights of free speech can be respected while offer also fostering a sense of community and respect for an individual's or a group's sensitivities to perceived hurtful or discriminatory, or discriminatory speech, and who decides what that kind of speech is. And while the focus tonight is on anti-Semitism, it clearly raises the larger issue of how to promote intellectual and political discourse on sensitive issues, rather than to create a situation where many avoid an issue entirely because the terms of engagement are so fraught and contentious which in my mind undermines the whole purpose of the university. So our agenda tonight is as follows. Uh, our first speakers will be UCSC professors Bettina Apdecker and Peter Kinez to provide historical expert in their areas of expertise. Uh, each will speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, then we will begin a discussion with our two guest panelists that will last about 50 or 60 minutes, followed by a question and answer period, and all of you should have received index cards in your program uh, when you walked in. If you didn't, there are more there as well as pencils. Um, I want to stress our expectations on, uh, for civility on the part of everyone here tonight. Um, I want to take a tip, in fact, from the Student Union Assembly meeting that I was at just a couple nights ago. Um, I want to ask people to please, please refra refrain from clapping, snapping, uh, other physical manifestations of opinions. It creates disruptions. It makes it difficult to hear in this room. Um, and also, to some, may be intimidating. There will be time for applause at the end. Uh, I want to remind everyone to please turn off your electronic devices. Uh, and for those of you who are new to our multi-purpose room, there are restrooms through the door to your right. Um, and if you do need to leave before the event is over, please do not leave through those doors, but leave through this door to my left, okay? Um, and also, before we begin, there are several people to thank. In particular, I want to take, thank the tech crew in the back, our co-curricular staff who've worked so hard on this, but particularly Jose Reyes Olivas for making this possible. Um, and I also want to thank the UCSC Alumni Foundation for, for providing support, okay? Okay, so let us begin. Uh, our first speaker uh, needs no real introduction on this campus. Neither of our campus speakers do. Uh, Bettina Apthecker has been a professor at UCSC since 1980 in feminist studies, and she's also a faculty member in the Jewish Studies program. As an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, she co-led the free speech movement from 1964 to 65, and has served on and chaired UCSC's Senate Committee on Academic Freedom. Her most recent book is a memoir entitled Intimate Politics, How I Grew Up Red, Fought for Free Speech, and Became a Feminist Re Rebel. And she's now working on a new book about gays and lesbians and the communist and left movements in the United States. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bettina Aptheker. Thank you, Helen, very much. I brought my own water. I see there's water up here, so. Okay, <clears throat> so I want to welcome everyone. So I'm your first speaker, so here we go. And I also want to thank uh, College 9 and 10, uh, Provost Helen Sh Shapiro and the staff and everyone for making this forum possible. Um, in my allotted time, I want to see if I can explain and clarify the historic, political, and legal differences between academic freedom on the one hand and freedom of speech on the other. And just to be clear, legally, there is no such thing as academic free speech, which is the title of this forum. <laughs> and I just think that's funny. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I began my undergraduate career at UC Berkeley in 1962, my father, Herbert Aptaker, a rather notorious communist, 
And also, I widely recognized his star in an African American history, was invited by the faculty of the Berkeley History Department to give a talk in his scholarly field. This was because that in 1960, uh, so the university administration banned my dad from speaking. This was because in 1962, university-wide regulations prohibited members of the Communist Party from speaking on any university campus. My father, this was true all across the United States, my father ended up literally across the street from the campus at a place called Stiles Hall, right on Bancroft. He was introduced uh, by Professor Kenneth Stamp, who was one of the department's most illustrious scholars. This ban on communist speakers existed everywhere in the United States and had been in place for decades. Likewise, at the UC's invited speakers, um, at the UC's invited speakers designated as controversial by the university administration could either be banned outright or the host department or sponsoring group could be required to bring another speaker to counter the ideas of the controversial one. These were the regulations. Likewise, no student organization or campus group of any kind, even a religious group or an academic department, could set up tables on the campus to advocate their ideas or put out their literature. No one could hand out flyers of any kind on the campus whatsoever. Faculty and staff who attempted to do this could be brought up for disciplinary action. Students could be suspended or expelled. Such was the state of freedom of speech not only at the UCs, but at universities and colleges across the country at the beginning of the 1960s. Um, I don't have time tonight to go into all the details of what led to the free speech movement at UC Berkeley. It was in September of 1964. I just even cut more here, so I'd stay within my time frame. Uh, but the end result of the free speech movement was that the Berkeley faculty, after sit-ins and a strike and goodness knows what else, held an emergency meeting of their academic senate um, on, September, uh, excuse me, on December 8th, 1964. And by a vote of 824 to 115, that's a whopping majority, affirmed the demands of the free speech movement. As a result of this, the regents meeting on December 14th, 1964, in an emergency session, declared that, quote, henceforth, university regulations will not go beyond the purview of the First and Fourteenth Amendments to the United States Constitution. This was a huge revolution in American higher education. I can't stress that enough. It was huge, and it swept the country. Um, and this was freedom of speech at Berkeley. This was what that movement was about. And it basically broke the back of the McCarthy era. Just that was the end of the McCarthy period of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. And it opened up the campuses to all kinds of speakers and ideas and protests and, and affirming actions as well. I'm very deeply humbled and honored that I happened to be in Berkeley in the 1960s and that I had an opportunity to participate uh, in this movement. Freedom of speech, as upheld again and again by the courts in this country, including the United States Supreme Court, is very nearly absolute. In fact, even hate speech, which I put in quotes because it's a term, more directly, I don't mean it as that it's not hate speech, I just mean it's a, it's a specific term. Even hate speech, more directly relevant to tonight's discussion, for example, speech that might well be deemed racist, anti-Semitic, homophobic, uh, profoundly misogynist, including picketing events, including even funerals of, for example, gay military personnel killed in action, which has happened. The United States Supreme Court has repeatedly, quote, extended broad protection in the area of hate speech. The justices have consistently held that statutes punishing speech or conduct solely on the grounds that they are unseemly or offensive are unconstitutionally overly broad. Only by protecting all forms of speech can the public be assured of uninhibited, vigorous, and wide open debate. And it's a quote I was quoting from Oxford Companion to the United States Supreme Court. There are numerous cases over and over again where the court has held in this way. It's virtually, it's almost absolute. It's not absolute in the sense that you know, the test that you can't 
shout fire in a crowded theater. You know, that's the famous case of Justice Holmes. But that idea, US law different from European law. European law much more restrictive and very different. So you should know that also. On a rather personal note, the entrance to the UC Berkeley campuses, campus was, uh, was picketed for days by the, American, by the members of the US Nazi party in full prominent regalia displaying the swastika in 1965 with signs that read, burn aptaker. I took this rather personally. <laughs> Their speech was protected. Their speech was protected. Academic freedom is totally different. It has a different origin, a different history, and I emphasize this, it does not have the force of constitutional law. Academic freedom in the United States began, really, really began in 1915, significantly during World War I, and the fierce debates about the character of that war and whether or not the United States should enter it, and the repression that was visited against the scholars in particular, especially in economics departments, who opposed the war. And that's where freedom of sp uh, academic freedom originally arose. Um, and the fundamental principles of academic freedom were articulated by the American Association of University Professors, AAUP, in 1915, I am quoting. Academic freedom consists in the absence of or protection from such restraints or pressures, chiefly in the form of sanctions threatened by state or church authorities, or by the authorities, faculties, or students of colleges and universities, but occasionally also by power groups in society, as are designed to create in the minds of academic scholars, teachers, research workers, and students in colleges and universities fears and anxieties that may inhibit them from freely studying and investigating whatever they are interested in and from freely discussing teaching or publishing whatever opinions they have reached, close quote. That is academic freedom. That is the origin of it, 1915. It has been upheld in universities and colleges over and over again. It's always been a struggle. There have been fights, there have been, as I'll show you. The AAUP continued the claim to freedom is made in the interests of the integrity and progress of scientific inquiry. It is therefore only those who carry out such inquiry in the temper of scientific inquirer who may justly assert this claim. The liberty of the scholar within the university to set forth his sick conclusions, I just mean it's her also, <clears throat> uh, be, they, be they what they may be, is conditioned by their being conclusions gained by the scholar's method and held in the scholar's spirit, and so on, okay? Now, next, very important. The traditional view of academic freedom also embraces, and this is fundamental to it, the principle of self-government by the faculty. That is, the right of the faculty to govern itself in determining all scientific and scholarly matters, including their exclusive right to evaluate each other's work and qualifications. Okay, so I'm gonna skip a little bit of that statement. If you want it or need it, you can talk to me and I'll, I'll send it to you. Who has academic freedom? All faculty with tenure track, tenured or lecturer positions has academic freedom. This is because any courses they teach are sanctioned by the Senate Committee on Educational Policy that is a faculty body. This is faculty governance. CEP determines the competence of the instructor and the competence of the course. Graduate students enjoy academic freedom only as an extension of their supervising faculty. All faculty appointments at whatever rank are approved by the Senate Committee on Academic Personnel, here it's called CAP. This is for new appointments, promotion, tenure, and so on. The review is very rigorous, and um, CAP recommends or not appointment, promotion, tenure at whatever rank. Then it goes to the executive vice chancellor, who is also an academic, who makes the final determination. Staff on campuses, undergraduates, do not have academic freedom. 
Everyone on the campus, faculty, staff, students, everybody enjoys freedom of speech. You got the distinction? Do you understand the difference? Okay. Um, and then there are committees that are faculty run for faculty who are alleged to violate professional standards in whatever way and for whatever reason they may so be charged. And that's the Committee on Tenure and Privilege. Okay. I just want to end this way. My husband at the time, Jack Kurzweil, 1970, was denied tenure as a member of the Electrical Engineering Department at San Jose State University. And his department faculty voted for tenure, split vote. The review committee, like their committee on academic, voted for tenure, split vote. And the president of San Jose State fired him. Then uh, he appealed. There was an appeal. It went on and on. Okay. End of appeal. Um, he wins the appeal. The chancellor of the state universities altogether fires him. Then we sued in federal court. And um, I won't go into all the details, but we found in the written record the fact that Jack was opposed tenure because he was literally, literally married to me. And I was a known member of the Communist Party. That was in the record. So you could see that everything else that they said about him was just a made up thing. Okay, so went to federal court. District Court Judge Alfonso Zerpoli found in Jack's favor and directed the president of San Jose State University and the chancellor of the state universities to, to grant him tenure. This was 1971 and he was granted tenure. It was a historic case and it set a precedent in terms of what could and could not be done. Now in Jack's case, freedom of association, which is the First Amendment, right? Because he was associated with me. And freedom of uh, academic freedom had also been violated. Do you see? Both things in his case, but that's unusual. Usually it's one or the other. Such are some of our adventures and such are the distinct parameters of freedom of speech and academic freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bettina. I didn't realize that we couldn't even give a title of a, a president of a forum without consulting with you first. Next, I should have known better. Um, our next speaker is Peter Kanez, Professor Emeritus of History and a scholar of Russia and the former Soviet Union. Professor Kanez was a founding faculty member of Stevenson College here at UCSC and was involved in the establishment of the Jewish Studies Program. He is author of nine books, including A History of the Soviet Union from the Beginning to the End, and the autobiographical Varieties of Fear Growing Up Jewish Under Nazism and Communism. He is currently working on a study of the Holocaust. Professor Kanez retired in 2011 after more than 45 years of teaching at UCSC, uh, but remains active on campus as evidenced by his participation tonight. Please join me in welcoming Professor Peter Kanez to the stage. And I am here to uh, talk about the concept of anti-Semitism. And I want to make three points. One is that anti-Semitism is much too large a concept. That is, not on all anti-Semites anti are alike. In fact, we published a book with Bruce and Murray entitled Varieties of Anti-Semitism. And indeed, uh, there is a big difference between, uh, uh, let us say, uh, in the olden days, a Ukrainian peasant who felt uh, exploited by the Jewish agent of his landlord, uh, or uh, uh, church-inspired anti-Semitism, or uh, uh, the contempt of a British lord for the Jewish parvenu. Now, it is true that anti-Semites use often the same um, images and they learn from one another. But underneath, they are after different things. Um, and this we should keep in mind because this makes it easier for us to respond, uh, to listen to uh, what they are saying. 
Now, of course, all uh, prejudice is something unattractive, and attributing the same characteristics of a group, in this instant, to the Jews, is, uh, is, an, is an error, and we, and we should deplore it. But we must respond differently. It seems to me that anti-Semitism in the olden days, uh, in feudal Europe, uh, where Jews represented uh, a well-established uh, caste, uh, they were uh, hated because they represented the other, uh, is something profoundly different than what happened in the modern age when the Jews became obviously successful and consequently inspired fear and hatred, which was not there in the olden days. And what I want to say is that we need not worry. A little anti-Semitism does not take us to Auschwitz. Uh, uh, what happened in the Nazi era was not the result of uh, excessive anti-Semitism of the Germans. Uh, all sort of things had to come together to end with that dreadful result. So um, uh, we need not be uh, uh, overly concerned by uh, what seems to us as something uh, uh, unattractive uh, exhibition of uh, attributing uh, unpleasant uh, characteristics to Jews. My second point is that what happened in the United States since the 1950s is an enormous change. When I was a student at Princeton, Princeton had a Jewish quota of 5%. Princeton had no Jewish professors. Other Ivy League uh, uh, institutions did. Columbia did better. But anti was uh, a very meaningful concept, and as a consequence, people were disadvantaged. Now, my sense is that no one here actually felt harmful effect, aside from being um, psychologically hurt as a result of anti-Semitism. Now, anti-Semitism is well and alive in certain places, uh, for example, in Eastern Europe. Um, in my country of origin, uh, Hungary is, uh, is the, the, the headquarter of neo-Nazism. Poland uh, is no better. What is going on there? I suppose what is going on there is a desire to uh, uh, define the nation narrowly, us against them, and the Jew is the proverbial other. And uh, uh, this, has, uh, uh, this has consequences. Um, uh, uh, people are, in fact, uh, harmed as a result of, uh, of this type of anti-Semitism which exists, and well, in, in Europe. For example, uh, the Hungarian right-wing party, which got 16.5% um, uh, of the vote in the last election, um, is uh, uh, profoundly pro-Iran, and thereby is being excluded from the community of European right-wing parties. Uh, and they are prof uh, uh, passionately pro-Iran because they hate the Jews so much. Well, uh, uh, Hungary has something like uh, 100,000 Jews, uh, Poland has about 5,000 Jews, and, uh, and uh, it's there. Why is that, that in the United States the change was so profound? It was not the consequence of the experience of the Holocaust. It's not the memory of the Holocaust. The change came later. The Holocaust did not diminish anti-Semitism in the United States according to public, public opinion surveys. Uh, the change came in the 1960s when so much else uh, uh, changed. Well, um, what are we talking about? The underlying issue, really, it seems to me, uh, is not anti-Semitism as such, but anti-Israelism. Now, of course,
course, there is a connection between anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism. But uh, it's also uh, not the same. We are talking about different things. How should uh, Jews respond to anti-Israelisms? Well, uh, first of all, we must recognize that there is uh, a government there which takes actions over which we have no control, for which we cannot take responsibility. Now, as um, Helen said, we are not here to debate the rights and wrongs of the, of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is, of course, uh, much too complicated. And it seems to me that it's perfectly all right for Jews, for Jewish students, to take an interest of what is happening in Israel and root for the Israelis and be concerned for the survival of Israel, on the one hand. On the other, we must not define our self-identity by identifying with any government, including the US government which God knows uh, uh, can be criticized without us feeling hurt and insulted by it. Um, what am I saying? I am, uh, I am saying that uh, it is our obligation to, uh, to listen to what people are saying on our side and on the other side. Uh, and uh, and deplore um, what uh, seems unfair. On the other hand, we must also recognize that everybody thinks, really everybody thinks, that the other sides control the media. We all agree on this point. Because otherwise they couldn't believe all that nonsense. In reality, it's very difficult to deal with this psychologically, people think people think differently. They evaluate the same events differently, and we have to live with it. I think I was ten minutes. Uh, Thank you, Peter. And with those kind of introductions to provide historical context, uh, we turn to our panel discussion. Uh, we have two distinguished guests with us. And before we be, I give them uh, longer introductions, I want to express uh, my sincere gratitude to them for being willing to come and engage with us on these issues. Uh, let me just say that it was not easy to get a panel together. Uh, as I mentioned, given how fraught this issue has been, uh, and how polarizing. Um, there were people who would not be present with us tonight. Um, and so, again, I'm very pleased that uh, our two guests have been willing to come and speak with us and for all of you for being here as well. Um, our first uh, panelist is Richard Barton by alphabetical order. Uh, Rick is an attorney who has represented healthcare providers and health systems for over 30 years. As trial counsel, uh, he has tried and arbitrated over 100 matters in both federal and state court. He has been recognized as one of America's best lawyers, San Diego's top lawyers, and is a member of the American Board of Trial Attorneys and a fellow in Litigation Council of America. He serves as an adjunct professor of law at the University of San Diego School of Law, where he teaches healthcare law and policy. And uh, he has also served as a local and national leader in the Anti-Defamation League for over 20 years, including serving as national leadership, leadership chair and chair of the National Education Committee. In 2010, Mr. Barton was appointed by University of California President Mark Udoff to serve on the President's Advisory Council of Campus Climate, Culture, and Inclusion. He was also appointed, appointed by UC San Diego Chancellor uh, Fox to the UCSD Climate Council, in which he is still active. 
He was a co-author of the 2012 report that I mentioned, University of California Jewish Student Campus Climate Fact-Finding Team Report and Recommendations, and was also part of the discussions on the Campus Climate Report for Arab and Muslim students uh, in that same visit. Our second panelist is Yaman Salahi. Mr. Salahi also is an attorney from the Los, area, Los Angeles area who works especially on areas of social justice. He is currently an Arthur Lehman Fellow at the American Civil Liberties Union of Southern California, where his work focuses on the civil rights and liberties of Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian communities, particularly those affected in the post-9-11 uh, police uh, practices. He follows free speech issues on university campuses, particularly as they play out in regard to student activism around US foreign policy and Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He obtained his law degree from Yale Law School, uh, where he worked with a team of other students in the Workers and Immigrants Rights Advocacy Clinic to advocate against racial profiling by the East Haven Police Department targeting Latinos. He's a graduate of UC Berkeley, where he is a member of Students for Justice in Palestine and also Cal Students for Equal Rights and a Valid Education, or CalServe. Um, and they are each here tonight speaking as individuals. This identification, this, this, uh, these groups, et cetera, is just for identification purposes. So please join me in welcoming Rick and Iman. Okay. Welcome, gentlemen. Well, we just had some um, very uh, inspiring comments by my two colleagues. And they both talked about uh, first kind of uh, the kind of two issues that kind of overlap in some respects. So that's what we're trying to get at: the First Amendment, uh, uh, free speech rights, and also academic freedom, uh, and also questions about anti-Semitism. And I'd like to kind of turn it over to both of you in terms of how you understand uh, First Amendment rights on campus. And is there a basis to the argument that respect for free speech may at times need to be tempered with principles of community that reflect individual or group sensitivities? So. Wow, thank you. Um, thanks to all of you for being here. We're taking on a very simple subject tonight, um, as you can tell. Um, so I, I, let, me, let me start with a, a couple of, of, of very basic things with respect to the, the Constitution and free speech. And it is absolutely correct that hate speech is protected speech um, under the Constitution. You cannot be prosecuted for going onto a corner and yelling hateful things. Um, you, um, if you write things about particular groups, you can be protected. So. The, the, the question of what is legal under the First Amendment um, is, I totally agree with Professor Aptiker who said that the protection is extremely broad and that is particularly true with respect to political speech. That is anything that deals in any sort of context of, of, of geopolitics, et cetera. So the government is going to give wide berth to those who, in any context, who are gonna come on and, and advance a particular position vis-a-vis um, -vis their beliefs. What we're really sort of dealing with, though, is the issue of, as, as you put it, the sensitivity of those who are hearing the speech. And it is in that context that a whole series of rules have been constructed for all of us in the workplace, in, in, uh, I I with respect to uh, professional standards of, of professors, et cetera, it, 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 we all know that there are things that you simply, if you say them and they are hurtful and they are racist and they are bigoted and they, and they have a particular message, that those particular messages that you send out are going to be reacted to and they are going to offend. And, and what we have been struggling with so mightily with respect to this particular issue is confusing the two concepts. We, we, because when people say things that are hurtful, they may have a right to say them, 
but that doesn't immunize them for criticism of what the underlying message is and what it might perpetuate. And so what you have in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian um, uh, discussion and, and, and debate on campuses is you have groups that have particular agendas and having been involved in this so, you know, over the past few years and, and so deeply, I have spent so much time listening to students, listening to faculty, et cetera, is you have two groups that are struggling mightily to help, to, to essentially deal with very diverse views on the situation in the Middle East and what should be done about it. Um, and so that's, to me, where the focus of all of this is. And then, uh, Yaman, okay. yeah. Sure. I want to echo my thanks uh, to everybody who's involved in organizing this panel and, of course, to everybody who's attended. I think this is a really important issue, and it's, it's only uh, too frustrating that this has happened a year after um, all the discussions have already started about this issue on university campuses. But I'm, I'm glad that the, the direct kind of conversation has gotten started. Um, I'm going to be, try to be clear at the beginning that there's a very important distinction between the merits of the debate uh, about Israel and Palestine and the right to have that debate in the first place. And I think I have a clear track record on what my position is about the actual conflict and how I feel about it. But I think that it's a separate issue from whether or not we should even be allowed to have that conversation on university campuses. And it's important to maintain that distinction um, in this conversation, although I'm sure my position will leak out here and there uh, as we continue today. Um, when it comes to the First Amendment and free speech and academic freedom on campus, I think it's really important to ask what purposes those values serve on campus. Uh, because that, that, that goes beyond the question of what the law currently says and goes to the question of what, it, what we want it to say and what we think it should say. Thanks. So if you think about the role that a university plays in our society, it plays many roles, but one of those is to help, a tr help fulfill a truth-seeking function. UC's motto is fiat lux, let there be light, so that people know what's going on. People understand, people use their intellect and their rational argument. It doesn't mean everybody's gonna arrive at the same truth, but it means that there's an, an opportunity there for scholars and intellectuals and students even to play a role in, in, in showing the rest of society what their research and scholarship has yielded. So the rest of society can use that to the benefit of society as a whole. And when you start interfering with the ability of people to engage in that research, you start undermining the integrity of the process. If you're withholding your, if you're refraining from certain forms of scholarship because you fear that you're gonna come out uh, contrary to the, the political establishment or contrary to powerful social forces, you're also undermining the, the role that you're playing in society uh, in pursuing and exposing truths. And although it's correct, as Professor uh, Aptiker mentioned, that there's not a separate doctrinal uh, kind of framework for academic freedom on campus, there's a lot of Supreme Court language that speaks about the, the special importance of the First Amendment on campus. Um, so just reading a few, the essentiality of freedom in the community of American universities is almost self-evident, the Supreme Court has said. To impose any straitjacket upon the intellectual leaders in our colleges and universities would imperil the future of our nation. Scholarship cannot flourish in an atmosphere of suspicion and distrust. These are all kind of references that the Supreme Court has made time and time again about the special importance of freedom of speech on university campuses, not only for uh, professors and faculty, but also for students, whether they're engaging in research and writing their, their stuff or engaging in protests on their campuses. Um, and so I, I think that that's, that's really the, the important part here. And I do, I do dispute, I do take uh, issue with the, with the notion that this is a debate about the limits on free speech. I don't think that uh, the speech at issue here, which has to do with the kind of vigorous protest activity and vigorous ac uh, advocacy by student organizations uh, promoting Palestinian human rights, is hate speech to begin with. I think it can be in some situations. Gonna, excuse me, I'm going to ask not for applause or noise. Thank you. Yeah, and that's not to say that there aren't people out there who are unfair in their criticisms of, you know, Israel or of other, of other political entities in, in the world, but you can't use the, unfair, the occasional unfair accuser to cast a shadow of suspicion and doubt over everybody else who's trying to debate on this issue. Um, and so I, I'll leave my starting remarks at that, but I, I think we can move on. Okay. 
Yeah, well, I think that the, therein lies the problem, and, and that is, is that very clearly the Jewish community views much of the protest activity which calls for, which, which labels Zionism as racism, which questions the Jewish right to self-determination, which, which brings in themes of Jewish control, um, et cetera, the Jewish community hears those messages and they react to them, and that's where the struggle is. You, you know, there are organizations built so, completely around this issue. The, um, the uh, uh, European Union has put together working groups with respect to looking at this issue, with respect to anti-Semitism, messages with respect to Israel, whether or not those are anti-Semitic, et cetera. So to, to you, I don't think that you can simply dismiss this as simply it's protest about Israeli policies. And let me give you an example. So if we were to say that our discussion is limited to a protest simply about whether or not Israel should occupy the West Bank, I would suggest to you that you would get a almost uniform, uniform agreement in, in many ways with respect to that being a legitimate criticism of the government of Israel no one would say to you that is illegitimate. So then why all the fuss? Why is this the way, the, 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 the focus, the way that it is? And what I would suggest is, is that this whole movement has offered something much beyond simply criticism of the Israeli government. It has, it has used imagery with respect to Jews and their treatment of Palestinians depicting them as Nazis, something that they're doing on campuses where you have the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. They are using imagery which is essentially demonizing Jews. And, and, and um, if you look at the Arab press, and which many organizations do with respect to their portrayal of Jews, this is not simply about simple criticism of Israeli policies. Israeli policies are criticized all the time. This is a debate about the nature of that criticism. How far does it go? How far are you going to take the images and the positions that you take with regard to Jewish self-determination, Jewish nationalism? That's where this debate is, and that's why people are upset. Okay. Do you want to speak? Sure. So, I think the, the easy the easy position uh, and really the right position is that everybody involved in this debate is opposed to is opposed to racism, whether that manifests itself in the form of anti-Semitism or otherwise. I mean, the student organizations that are working on these issues, from what might be termed a pro-Palestinian perspective, have released statement after statement condemning anti-Semitism when they see it. They have consistent debates within their own organizations and amongst one another about how you best communicate a message while being aware of the sensitivities of different audiences to your message and how you best uphold the principles that you're claiming to proclaim. I mean, our, I think our guiding principle is that racism in Israel and Palestine is part of the problem, not the solution, either there or here on university campuses. And so I think that it's one of the, one of the chief um, kind of tasks and missions of people who are, who are uh, purporting to stand up for Palestinian human rights to also be standing up against anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry within their movement and elsewhere when, where they see it. So I don't think that that's the hard issue. I think the issue is really a political dispute, and it's a dispute that goes in some circumstances to what the solution is and how you go about that solution. So the, the inquiry that uh, Mr. Barton just framed is if you have a debate about whether or not the occupation is right or wrong, you'll have unanimous agreement. But there's no reason why our inquiries should be framed so narrowly. There are so many other aspects of this issue to talk about, whether it's historical debate, contemporary policies, solutions, remedies, all kinds of aspects of this. And it's just not the case that you can speak of a monolithic Jewish community on this issue, or a monolithic Palestinian community, or a monolithic Arab or Muslim community. 
you have a multiplicity of opinions and a diversity of viewpoints within all of those communities on all of these key issues, whether it's about the merits of the Israeli-Palestinian debate, the merits of Zionism as an ideology, and there's not one form of Zionism. There's, you can read a book by Walter Lecker called The History of Zionism, and it talks about all the various different uh, intellectual threads and political threads of Zionism throughout history. It's historically contingent. There's, and so, once you start looking at those multiplicity of viewpoints, you can't just caricature a certain community as being pro or against. So it's not the case that there are two groups on campus. There are multiple groups on campus. When I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, um, it started out th that there was one, one organization that held itself out as the pro-Israel organization on campus. It was called the Israel Action Committee. By the time I graduated, there are at least three different groups with di completely different approaches. One was called Tikva, and it had a very kind of right-wing nationalist uh, uh, position in my opinion. Another one was called Kesha Onoshi and it had a very kind of liberal perspective on the issue. So even within what you might want to loosely umbrella as the, the pro-Israel uh, groups on campus, there's so many, so many different viewpoints that you can't just say that everybody sees things the same way. Okay. When, I mean, part of the kind of issues that come up, particularly for uh, working with students on this, is that um, different definitions of anti-Semitism have been put forward and students try to figure this out in terms of uh, it's people who haven't been so invested in the struggle. And um, some refer to the definitions used under certain uh, conditions by the U.S. State Department or the European Union, which, uh, and those imply that questioning Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state is by inherently anti-Semitic. Um, and therefore, even for some, raising the question of the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement is inherently anti-Semitic and can't be uh, and therefore should not be discussed. Um, other parts of that definition include comparing Israeli actions to those of the Nazis, as you mentioned, um, and using what they see as a double standard expected uh, towards Israeli policy, and a double standard towards Israeli actions that isn't used for other nations, and that also is anti-Semitic. Can you talk about those definitions and how one can, as, some, as students trying to come to grips, or any of us trying to come to grips with that, kind of uh, respond to that and also clarify whether there's any legal standing in the United States or in our institutions for those definitions because often during discussions those definitions are thrown out and people don't really know how to respond. And I'll leave it to you. Do you mind, you wanna take that first? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Well, I think before I go into the, these particular definitions mm -hmm. that you cited, I'm going to try to cite some of the examples that are, are some of the examples of speech on campus that are used to, uh, um, that are referred to as examples that would be considered anti-Semitic under those definitions. So one issue that's come up uh, in the campus climate reports and in House Resolution 35 has been the use by students of mock checkpoints. And these are theatrical demonstrations on campus where Students dress up as soldiers, they dress up as Palestinians, and they try to do a dramatic reenactment of what they say uh, checkpoints look like in the occupied West Bank. And so this is how this event is characterized in the lawsuit that was filed against UC Berkeley. It says, the student's experiences at the checkpoints were terrifying and demeaning in extreme degrees. She describes the frenzy of those wearing military uniforms and carrying reali realistic assault weapons. The soldiers holding realistic assault weapons and other participants shouted and yelled at passing students, prepare to be stopped, what is your religion? The first time she was stopped, she was absolutely terrified. No one before had ever stopped her while carrying an assault rifle and yelling. She was ashamed, she was terrified for weeks. So this is an example of the kind of student speech that uh, has given rise to complaints in federal court and also with the, with the Department of Education. And there are a couple points about this. One is that this is clearly a theatrical performance. And if that theatrical performance was so terrifying, then the real thing can only be so much worse. And that's the, the source of political tension for me is that if you're going to object to these theatrical reenactments on campus, you have to object to the real thing in the Occupied West Bank against the real people who are going through real checkpoints with real soldiers with real guns, and it, it's resulted in real injuries and real deaths. And that, that's, that's, I think, one of the political ironies about, about, this, about this situation. Um, according to Vitsalem, there are 98 such checkpoints in the West Bank and hundreds more that are just put up on a, they're called flying checkpoints, they kind of come up spontaneously and move around spontaneously. And I use that just because I think it's important 
in having this discussion, not just to stick to the high level uh, kind of framing discussions where we're not really sure what we're talking about, but to look at the actual facts of what people are complaining about and how we understand those. Another example, uh, which Mr. Barton alluded to, are the accusations that Israel has engaged in genocide, war crimes, or apartheid. And I'll say outright that, again, we have to separate the merits of these claims from the right to make these claims. I disagree with the contention that Israel is committing genocide. I think that that's hyperbolic and not credible and not a helpful uh, advocacy strategy. I think that there is salience to the claim that the system of laws and uh, military occupation in Israel resembles apartheid in South Africa. But the point is that we have different viewpoints about this and there's no reason why one viewpoint has a, has a greater right to express itself than another viewpoint on this issue. And so the, the, under the First Amendment law, you have equal rights to express your support for Israel as you do to express your opposition, regardless of whether that's opposition ideological, political, or based on particular specific practices or, 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 or whatnot. There's no principled basis on which to distinguish between those. And it doesn't help to call these political claims, these ideological claims, because when you say this is apartheid or this is genocide, you're making a political or ideological argument, and then you're gonna show your empirical data to try to back it up, and it's left to people to make their judgments about whether they agree or disagree. But when you try to label that to be an inherently racist claim, all you're doing is tilting the playing field in favor of one ideological position over another. And these definitions by the EU and by the State Department all attempt to do the same thing. But these are not authoritative, they have no legal authority, and to refer to them as if they are authority is just a fallacious argument from authority because if you look at it, it's essentially a circular argument. The groups who drafted these definitions are now the ones who want to use them against the people they disagree with. So you can't, it's not anti-Semitic because we said it was and this body agreed with us and now we're using it. There has to be another explanation. You have to go further than that. You have to have more, to, more substance to your argument beyond the, the, the pure argument from authority, which is that they have, this political organization has adopted this political definition okay. and whatnot. Well, I guess we're gonna disagree with respect to um, the, the source of the EU working definition and where, what its genesis it was. Its genesis was the European Union and um, others looking at the notion of anti-Semitism within Europe with, with respect to Israel and they created the standard. This wasn't the Jews who created these standards. This was, this was but, 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 but that was sort of what was implied, that the people who want to use them. So, so I think what you, we, we have to do is, is, is be very careful about sort of saying to, to or, or caricaturing a particular group as having a political aim of silencing only one kind of speech because the same people who are working in the, um, in the EU working group are also working on Islamophobia. They're also working on other forms of discrimination. They're also working on all sorts of different agendas with regard to discrimination against different groups. So they looked at this particular issue because their, their charge was racism and xenophobia. They looked at this particular issue, listened to scholars with respect to this, and came to these conclusions. The, the, the EU working definition has been translated into 33 separate languages. 56 countries within OEC, OESC has, have adopted the, the working definition. So, so to sit here and to claim that somehow this is just simply a political definition being manipulated in order to use, or in, in order to sort of silence speech, I think is, is, a, very, is a very troublesome characterization. With respect to whether or not the EU working definition is somehow authoritative, um, the answer is no. It's a working definition that was used as a guideline for those who, who are trying to struggle with a very complicated and very difficult issue. And so the EU working group put it out there for 
for governments to look at. You, if you look at the, gov uh, the courts in Lithuania, co courts in Germany have used it as a basis for analysis of some of these claims. But no, nobody can come in here and say the State Department says that this is anti-Semitism and therefore it is anti-Semitism. I think that everything in the way that these things work is you have to look at the situation, you have to look at, 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 at the entire context. And I don't think that, that anybody would, would come in and say that this is a binding document on a particular group. However, to simply dismiss it as not authoritative after all the work that had gone into it and all the scholarship that served as the basis for this and the acceptance of it by UN bodies, I think you, you, it, it would be a mistake simply to reject this outright. Yeah, I just want to respond uh, quickly to what I think is a mischaracterization of what I said. Um, my understanding about the genealogy of the EU working group definition is based on an article published in the Jewish Daily Forward where they spoke with uh, folks who work with certain organizations who were involved in the drafting of that. And part of the problem with the definition is that the process through which it went did not involve, to my knowledge, people with different perspectives about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict who would have been able to identify some of, the, some of the aspects of the definition. The definition is not entirely unproblematic. There are a few aspects of it that are, and those are the ones that try to characterize political views as being inherently anti-Semitic. The groups who might have a different perspective about this political issue were not part of that process. So to say that it, ha it has credibility simply because it has gone through a process that wasn't did not involve input from various groups in the first place, I think is problematic. But I do want to be clear. I, I was not at all suggesting okay. uh, what, what you mentioned. Okay. Uh, let me bring it back to what, we, you know, some students, uh, our, some Jewish students have claimed at our campus and also came up in the campus climate report. Um, in terms of uh, experiencing anti-Semitism, that for some students, and these were also questions that we solicited for students before we uh, did this debate. Uh, for some students, um, they would say that their Jewish cultural and religious identity cannot be separated from their uh, identity with Israel, and therefore they take uh, certain attacks on the state of Israel very much on an, as, an, as a personal attack on their uh, and their individual identity. And, it, and although others would say that it's political speech, um, some students have argued that uh, other students who feel victimized by either racist or homophobic speech wouldn't be asked to defend their claims in the same way. And so, again, this is a question that's come up. It came up in your report. Um, and I'd like to just respond to that in terms of something that we on campuses are grappling with, particularly as we think about larger principles of community in terms of respecting difference. I think you have to understand for Jews what Israel represents, for, for some Jews, what, what Israel represents. And those who closely identify with Israel um, view the movements with respect to um, uh, the BDS movement and these other movements that question the, the, the existential um, right of, of, of Israel. Um, I think they view this through the lens of just simply a continuation of the delegitimization of Jews to their own aspirations. And so it, it isn't to say that, that Jewish students or some Jewish students identify with it so much that they can't separate these things. And as I said, and, and again, we, we, I think we have to be extremely careful about all of this. There are so many Jewish students who, who, who identify with Israel, but they identify with it in so many different ways, and that's incredibly complex. And they will identify with it in, way, in a way which is very critical of the, uh, of the Israeli government. They themselves have very strong viewpoints with respect to what Israel is, what it should be, what the occupation represents. There's a huge spectrum of opinion within our, within our own community. But what I would suggest is, is that when you tell students and when you embrace a movement, which is, which is what it has done here, the BDS movement, which is basically a movement to essentially question the right of Israel as a Jewish state to exist, 
you are going to have Jews who essentially react to that. And what I would suggest is, is that the most telling point about BDS in, in terms of whether or not it, 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 simp it is, um, uh, and, and how it should be viewed, is that J Street itself views the BDS movement and um, as antithetical to um, principles um, that they espouse. They see it as anti-Semitic. So when you can't even get J Street to sort of, to, to, to essentially move with this particular program, you are, you, you, you are witnessing something which is extremely, extremely on, on the, on the margins. And so that, I think, is where this issue of, of identity comes up. Jewish students, most Jewish students that I know, are very capable of having a very, very good rational debate about the policies in Israel. And I, I want to keep going back. This is not a debate about, it is a debate about the nature of this, um, or, or this, the, the discussion is about the nature of that debate and the imagery that's used and, 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 and the, um, uh, the, the belief of, of Jewish students and some Jewish students about the nature of the accusations that are being made against Israel. Okay. If I may, just for clarification, for you know, we can't assume that everyone knows the, what the details of the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement. That's not what this debate is about. But I also want to underscore that there are very many varieties within that movement, different proposals, different different um, different ideas within that, um, and different viewpoints about what it ultimately represents within Israel. So not all divestment uh, boycott proposals are the same. Do you want to respond to that? Sure. I think it bears noting that part, part of what's going on here is that part of, part of policing the boundaries of what it means to be anti-Semitic or what is legitimate criticism of Israel is also policing the boundaries of what Jewish identity is. So there's a lot going on here. And I, 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 I do dispute the notion, and I know you said some, not all, that, which is correct, but even for people who do identify with Israel, it doesn't mean that every criticism you hear about Israel or every heated, uh, every heated uh, argument against ideologies associated with the state of Israel is an attack on somebody individually as a person. I mean, I, I'll point to uh, something that caught my attention uh, just recently, which is a study by two UC Santa Cruz students that involved a survey of Jewish students in the UC system. And what they found was that attachment to Israel did not serve as a significant predictor for having negative or positive encounters with Arabs or Palestinians. In other words, the, the, way, that a, the way that an encounter uh, plays out doesn't have to do with a student's ident identification with the state of Israel necessarily. In fact, what they found was that the only significant predictor for negative encounters with Arabs and Palestinians was a lack of acknowledgement of the Palestinian narrative on the conflict. On the conflict. And that, that report um, was, was produced by a graduate student named Ella Ben Haggai and uh, an undergraduate student named Nadia Tanus. So I do think that there are some problematic assumptions that are, that are being made here about uh, the consequences of identification with Israel on how one responds to criticism of Israel. Um, with respect to the BDS movement, I'm not going to go into the details, but I do know that there's a divestment resolution that's being discussed in the UC Santa Cruz government next week student government next week. And what I gather from this discussion is that if there is a company, a corporation, we're talking about multi-million dollar international corporations that is involved with some government in some other part of the world, and one of its activities is to provide, say, bulldozers that are used then to demolish homes or demolish olive trees or take over land, that we can't do anything about that company and that corporate relationship because doing so goes into this anti-Semitic argument about BDS. And I just don't see that. You, you have to have consistent principles regarding corporate social responsibility, regardless of where it applies. You can't just carve this exception out for what's going on in Israel and Palestine and say, this is a place where we suspend human rights. This is a place where we suspend our normal ethical framework because we're so concerned about, about this other issue. I don't mean by that to diminish the seriousness of anti-Semitism wherever it occurs, but it also, there has to be an alternative that does not result in inaction or an inability to do anything productive with, or to confront concrete wrongs. And this is why I'm saying it's important to leave the big picture and look at the small, minute details on the ground because I don't understand any political ideology which says you cannot 
withdraw your investments in a company like Caterpillar or in a company like Northrop Grumman, which helps make weapons because of, because of the political context. But, but, but that's, I think you've made the point that the point is, is that you're only doing it with respect to one country. You're only doing it with respect to, to, to Israel. There are human rights violations going on, particularly with regard to pa Palestinians, all over the Middle East. Um, and so, but the, but the target here of the BDS movement is only with respect to companies that do business with Israel. So what you're going to do, if you, if, if look, again, Let's, let's all raise our hands as to whether or not we would support a movement that sought to end divestment with companies that supported racist, um, apartheid, ethnic cleansing anywhere in the world, right? But, but, but when you focus solely on one state, as, as the target of that, knowing that human rights violations are going on all around that, and, and when you also sort of decontextualize the violence with respect to what Israel is fighting, what there is re the Israeli Defense Force is there for, when, when you eliminate discussion with respect to why Israel would need the military capability to defend themselves with respect to rockets that come in and the terrorism because of rejectionism of Israel that has existed since the formation of the state, then you are going to open yourself up for the question of why only them. Okay. Response, and then I want to move beyond BDS. <clears throat> sure, sure. So, what I hear, if it is true that Israel is being singled out for attention, what I hear is an argument for more activism on more issues and not less activism on these issues. It doesn't make sense to me to, to say, why is Israel being singled out as the only target of, uh, of activism? Uh, and then respond to that by saying, well, let's not have any activism at all. I think it is instead incumbent to engage in more activism. And in fact, the UC, has, UC in particular and other universities have a long history of divestment activism with respect to other countries. South Africa was a target of divestment. Uh, Sudan, because of the Darfur conflict, was a target of divestment campaigns. Tobacco companies have been the target of divestment campaigns. Companies with bad environmental track records have been the target of divestment campaigns. So it's simply not true that there is only activism about this one issue. Second, what BDS is, is a response to a call by Palestinian civil society. I don't understand what the expectation is of Palestinian civil society living under Israeli occupation, not Chinese occupation, and not Iranian occupation. Why would they, why would they make a BDS call that calls for something else? It just doesn't make sense to me. It, it reflects a complete lack of sympathy with, with that perspective because they're, of course, they're going to want the world to engage in activism uh, against what they see as the problem in their, in their lives and not against everything else. Although I do think that people should be engaged in activism on all kinds of issues. Okay. We can get back to this. Yeah, okay, okay. all right. Just, it just th begs the whole question. Okay, it well, just uh, opens up the, the, the whole question. And, and so, all right. Okay, well, so. That, that, I mean, we're not necessarily going to solve this question. But we're I trying agree. to kind of I dialogue agree. on it and to elucidate the complexity of it. And so here we had one example when we talk about kind of how to even define anti-Semitism or hurtful speech, that that is very difficult. And so for those of us on this campus who are trying to figure this out, and many of us are, to both protect political speech, protect the rights of everyone, but also to be respectful, how... To, one of the things that we're grappling is, with is who defines those terms and how do we define those terms? And if we can't agree with you know, how to even begin and, and there are de definitions out there for all sorts of things and this is an issue whether it's anti-Semitism or, an, or other issues, if we are going to constrain certain types of speech or activities, Beyond a strict definition of free speech, it's very difficult once we begin trying to define that. Yeah. And that's something that both the Campus Climate Reports dealt with and what we're trying to, and as administrators, and I speak for myself here, trying to both be respectful of students' feelings in terms of respecting where they're coming from, but also respecting some of the complexities that we're talking about. And I'd like to follow up on another question that, again, has been very important to campus and has come up in the various complaints that has to do with sponsorship. And this is very much a university issue, as much of the BDS movement is. Um, some have argued that um, while students have a First Amendment right to show any film or bring a speaker, that this becomes problematic when 
an academic department or a college like ourselves uh, invites a speaker um, or sponsors an event that may be deemed anti-Semitic or ultimately may not be balanced. And I guess if either of you could speak about the issue of sponsorship on an academic campus and what that might mean. Some imply that sponsorship implies endorsement. Others say that sponsorship is not the same as endorsement. And also, what is the responsibility of those sponsoring agencies to um, not be perceived as one-sided and the whole question of how to balance and whether that's an objective or whether um, or, and again who defines that so yeah which of those questions do you, you want us start to with, answer you can start in, with in sponsorship court we would say and then, objection compound yes I know I know uh, um, but I'm, I'm trying to get them in and it would be sustained um, so so let me let me go back though to the to the first question that you asked about who defines what, and I think that is where the problem is, because um, I I think what we the, the 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 gap that exists is because we both define the what the offense is or should be very differently, and there is no discussion about it. What I've witnessed in doing the Climate Council report is this huge divide between these communities. And Yaman, when you were talking about all the other social justice issues that, that, that could be the subject of boycott, divestment, sanctions, you could get tremendous unity on this campus if indeed it was broader, if in, there, there could be tremendous sort of, of energy brought to all sorts of issues. And where I see the loss and, and the tragedy of what is happening on these campuses is that, that you are marginalizing and you are separating groups based upon this one struggle and it's formed this gigantic wedge and there's no discussion between the groups in a way that has them listening to one another. A lot of people are yelling at each other. A lot of people are mad at each other. A lot of people are accusing each other. But people aren't listening to one that they associate with somebody that they don't want to sit in the room with. And I've seen, in, in terms of at UCSD, where I sit on the Climate Council, arguments made that Jewish students should not be represented on the Climate Council because Jewish students are privileged. Jewish students, um, that the, the, the Climate Council should only be for underrepresented minorities. When you have an attitude about that, about a particular group, the joke at UCSD amongst the Jewish student organizations is, who is gonna finally get the Jewish Student Union to be a sitting member of the Student Affirmative Action Committee. The Student Affirmative Action Committee is the, is the central place where, um, uh, where social justice causes at UCSD are essentially um, looked at by the various organizations. Jewish Student Union, because it will not essentially agree that apartheid, genocide, ethnic cleansing is occurring in Israel, their application has not been acted on by SAC. When you have groups that are saying, I won't deal with that other person, the anti-normalization campaign, which is essentially, we won't even sit in the same room with these people, that destroys climate. And so those definitions, what I see as the tragedy is that people aren't listening to one another. People are willing to define, they're willing to adopt their own definition of what should or should not be anti-Semitism, what should or should not be offensive, and then blame the other for an overreaction. That's not listening to one another, and that's not dialogue, and that's not a good, healthy climate, and that's why we're here tonight. Well, it wasn't too long ago that I was myself a student activist about these issues when I was an undergrad at UC Berkeley. And what I, what I think is going on here is that there's an extreme underestimation of the amount of discussion and debate and dialogue that goes on between students with different political perspectives of it. And, you know, it's true at some campus events, especially when people are out doing a rally or some sort of public action, the kind of engagement tends to be more heated than when people are carrying on their side conversations, which tend to be ignored by, the, by people who are looking at this issue from the outside. But that's also part of what's going on. 
And people's views about this issue change dramatically over the four years that they're at university or however, however many years that they're there. And I saw that with my own eyes when I started out as a freshman and a lot of the people you know, who were on the scene and started getting involved by the end of the four years had completely changed their opinions or had matured in a certain way that helped them develop a more coherent understanding of the ethical issues that were at stake. So I, I, I think that that kind of debate and discussion, which is just natural, it doesn't have to be structured by the administration. It just happens because people go to the same classes and walk on the same campus and kind of have to acknowledge each other when they're sitting on other sides of the issue on public, on public debate. That kind of discussion is not mutually exclusive with the kind of activist campaigns that are going on, including divestment resolutions and including you know, tabling or uh, apartheid weeks or, or mock checkpoints and whatnot. That is all part of the same uh, fabric of campus debate and engagement. It's not mutually exclusive at all, and it happens at the same uh, it happens with the same people in different places, but in different ways from the kind of uh, formal maybe uh, dialogue that that uh, might be envisioning. Should we talk about the sponsorship, sponsorship question? Yeah. Or? Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, Sure, and and then what I'd like to do is if you wrap up and say where you think we should go from here mm -hmm. precisely to bring dialogue, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank yeah, you. I mean, sponsorship is 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 viewed by the university as providing an imprimatur, and and you know the the whole discussion again about free speech and academic freedom skews the discussion because you also have the whole notion of professional standards, and professional standards means that you attempt on on a university campus to lend balance, to not embrace views that are offensive to others. So the problem is, is that we know, we know that there is a problem with respect to how this debate with respect to Israel is unfolding. One community sees themselves as being demonized, et cetera. The other community views itself as being demonized, et cetera, because of having that message. So the problem is, I think you have, it's, it's a political thing. You have to be very careful about how it is that you present these particular um, programs. And what we see in sponsorship is, is that what the students want, when students pay their money to come here, is they would like their university to at least convey a sense of balance and a sense of objectivity and a sense of commitment to multiple messages. And I think where the problem with sponsorship comes in is, when, as we saw in Brooklyn College, et cetera, is when you have a particular message that is viewed as, um, as essentially anti-Semitic, you have the university then having to explain why it is that you would bring that on. And, and so it's just a matter of, of, of the view of those who are paying their money to go to the university and the belief that there should be some form of neutrality on the part, even though we want to discuss these difficult issues. Yeah. Sure. Well, I, I think terms like neutrality and objectivity are not going to be particularly useful here because it's impossible to define them and, and, and balance and define it in any really coherent way. So if, I, if let's say we're talking about a panel sponsored by a college on campus and it's going to discuss not what we're talking about here which is free speech but rather the issue over there. Is balance having one person who represents the Likud party and one person who represents the Palestinian Authority or is it having one person from the Palestinian Authority and one person from Kadima? Or is it having one person, you know, there's so many different views. It's just impossible to have a notion of balance. And especially in an academy, it doesn't make sense to me that you should have an ends-oriented definition of balance, where you must have one pro-Israel speaker, quote-unquote, and one pro-Palestinian speaker, quote-unquote. I think that the solution to this is not to put together criteria of balance, which are going to be problematic not only on this issue, but on every other issue on campus. If you're going to have a panel about immigrants' rights, does that mean you have to invite somebody from the Minutemen to join the panel because that, that's how you institute balance? It doesn't, it, 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 it's just, it's hard to find it. I think the solution to this, because there's always a risk of projecting an image of, of, of favoritism towards one set of views over another, is to make sure that other student groups and other faculty still have the freedom to bring the other points of view that they want to bring to campus to campus. And I haven't seen any shortage of different perspectives about the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict on campus. I've seen uh, what you can call pro-Israel groups bring many, many speakers that present many different viewpoints to campus. I've seen other groups bring different speakers with different viewpoints of campus that are more critical of Israeli policy. And as long as they have the ability to do that, I don't see a problem with a department sponsoring 
somebody who other people perceive to be as, as, uh, associated with one side or another of a conflict. And you know, it's true, sometimes departments uh, bring people who are seen to be as critical of Israel, sometimes they bring people who are seen to be supportive of Israel, sometimes they bring political leaders from Israel themselves. That was what happened at UC Irvine. The Israeli ambassador came to campus and gave a speech endorsed by, uh, and organized by the university. So I don't, I, don't, I don't see how this idea of balance is gonna play out. And I think that what it is really is just a rhetorical tool to criticize the way that speakers who are critical of Israel are able to come to campus without actually considering the ramifications of that idea in other contexts on campus. But, but I think we know that if, the, if this school sponsored only a Minuteman group to come in and speak, there would be protests. No one is saying you can't legally do it. All that people are saying is, is that a wise thing to do and should you be doing that? We know that if the, if, if the Department of Political Science sponsored a, meet, a, a, a discussion by the Klan with respect to their feelings about the Civil Rights Act, you know that there would be a huge uproar with respect to, um, with respect to the sponsorship of that particular group. You would say they might have the freedom to come on here, but they don't. And, and, but there's the nub of this, and this is the, the, the really difficult part of this, is understanding, and, and this will sort of go into my, my closing remarks, is, is why the Jewish community views this through the lens of anti-Semitism. And, 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 I, I do I, I want to sort of reflect on some of the comments that, that Professor Knez made, uh, made, and that is this, that anti-Semitism has historically morphed, and I totally agree with this notion that anti-Semitism comes from the right, it comes from the left, and, but its central focus is to distort and to project the Jew as the victimizer. And based upon the Jews' victimization of others, they are not entitled to the same rights, to the same um, sort of opportunities, to the same entitlements that other people have. For better or for worse, when you view the debate with respect to Israel, that is the lens through which the Jewish community views it. They see checkpoints and die-ins, et cetera, as distortions by decontextualizing why the checkpoints might be there. They will agree with you that the occupation may be evil. I believe that the occupation is morally abhorrent. I, I absolutely want Israel to end its occupation. But at the same time, I am not going to simply stand by while the protest over that particular policy is transmuted into the same distortions and the same messages about Jewish victimization that has led to so many disasters for the Jewish people. That's the lens. It is difficult for anyone to sit in a room with people who are this far from where the Holocaust was and, and, a, and a, a, for a community that was successful, you know, it was, was, was integrated, was assimilated within Germany, and say, don't respond to messages that you feel are a distortion of what's really going on. And that's the lens through which all of this is seen, and that's why you see all the emotion, I think. Okay, okay and I want to ri remind both speakers, this is taking also a guide from the SUA that be careful not to speak of general community as mm -hmm. a monolith. Please, go ahead. Yeah. I, w I was Stop going to say, noise, I, I did hear the, the phrase, the Jewish community feels this way or that way. Um, a couple I, I of did times not and... absolutely mean to speak for the entire okay. Jew because there's clearly a difference and I said that before. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I agree. I, I, I just, I don't think that that is what's going on. I think when somebody or a student group, I think these student groups, Students for Justice in Palestine, the groups that are having these events, whether it's, you know, or, or these, even these international organizations that are documenting human rights violations like uh, Amnesty International Human Rights Watch, I think they take great care to distinguish between what the state of Israel as a government, as, an, as a political entity with branches and bureaucracies and a military and its own internal laws and everything is doing and what they take great care to distinguish between that and between generalizations about the Israeli people or Jewish people around the world. So I, I just, I don't, I don't get I don't get how you can take a mock checkpoint, for example, uh, which is a dramatization of how Israeli soldiers at uh, checkpoints uh, 
act and take that as a message about how Jewish people are being portrayed. It's not about Jewish people. It's about IDF soldiers who are in uniform at actual checkpoints. So I don't, I don't, I just, I'm a little bit confused about that point. It seems to me like an equivocation between, and conflation between uh, ideas of, of Jewish identity and the Israeli state. Okay, do you have closing? Okay, you all have index cards, hopefully, in your programs. And if you'd like to write a question to either or both of the panelists, and we have students who will be collecting them, please raise your hand if you already have them, and we will do our best to take as many as we can. Holy one. <laughs> like I said, as many as we can. Right? Yeah, exactly. Sometimes there's repeats. <laughs> and sometimes you just have to call it. <laughs> yeah. Could I have them so we can begin? Okay. Let's see. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, question. Some students who identify strongly with Israel take it personally when other students criticize Israeli government policies. Would students of Iranian descent be able to make a similar claim regarding criticism of, of Iranian government policy? Is that, or is that analogous, I guess, is the question. So, so my, I think my answer would be, if, if a Jewish student is taking offense simply at criticism of, of Israeli policy, there's a problem. So, and again, that's the caricature. The caricature of us is, oh, we take offense at everything that's being said about, and that we take offense at any criticism of Israel, and we accuse the people who are being, uh, of, of, who are criticizing of being anti-Semitic. That's a caricature. That's just simply an untrue generalization. So if there are students, for me, if a student becomes offended just because somebody criticizes an Israeli policy, that student has a problem. I agree with that, but it is the campus climate report itself which says that for some students, Jewish identity is inextricably linked with the state of Israel, and so they take criticisms of Israel as a personal attack. And I ob object to that itself, but that's what the report itself said, and people are criticizing that aspect of the report. So I, I agree with that. And I think the example, the question about the Iranian student demonstrates exactly what's so problematic about these kinds of claims. You can't insulate the Iranian government from criticism because some people who are, have Iranian ancestry or Iranian nationality are offended by that. It just doesn't work that way. My family is Syrian origin. I'm not going to be restrained from criticizing the Iranian government for its ongoing support for the Syrian government after two years of massacre because some people might be offended uh, by it. I just don't think, and I don't think most Iranians are offended by it in that way. Um, because I know a lot of people who object to the policies of Iran in this respect. So. But, but see, that's the caricature. The caricature is, oh, Israelis are, are uh, you know, it, the, what I said in the climate report is that where the problem comes in is it's, it's the nature of it. That's why we went into the examples in, in the climate report. We didn't say that, that, that Jewish students told us that any criticism of Israel was offensive to them. And that's why I said if a Jewish student simply is offended by any criticism of the Israeli government, that student has a problem. 
Okay. The, yeah, right. I mean, I do think that folks should read these documents for themselves and make their own, because the, the examples in the report <coughs> are precisely what I mentioned earlier, which are the mock checkpoints. They're the claims that Israel engages in apartheid or war crimes. And it's, it, th those are the kinds of things that are used as examples. And I just, I don't, those don't seem to me to justify okay. an interpretation as okay, a person. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next yeah. question. Uh, could you both comment on the incident at UC, Ber uh, UC Irvine, excuse me, when Ambassador Oren was prevented from speaking? Go ahead, Mark. And you might want to give a little background, brief background for those who may not know what this is about. So this was an incident in February 2010 where uh, the ambassador uh, was invited to speak at UC Irvine and 11 students uh, from UC Irvine uh, stood up during the protest and shouted statements. I can't remember the words, but it was something like, um, stop, war crimes are not free speech or something to that effect. And they were escorted out of the, um, out of the event and then released, but a year later, one day before the statute of limitations would have run on this, uh, the district attorney filed charges against these students for disrupting a public meeting and conspiring to disrupt a public meeting. Um, I'm not sure what the what the question is is trying to get from us, but just can comment you on that the, again? They just said, could comment you comment on, on the incident? The I, I think I think it's illustrative of the unequal treatment of people. Uh, based on their views on this issue, because I, I can't imagine a similar response. I can't imagine a, a district attorney's office spending however much money, I don't even want to know, however much money it spent to prosecute these students for such a minor offense that was, uh, that was resolved as soon as they were escorted out of the room, um, if they hadn't been presenting a position that was critical of Israel and unpopular in the current uh, political establishment. That's, that's, that's how I see it. But I also, I will say on the record that I don't necessarily think that the kind of protest that they engaged in uh, was the most effective way of promoting their message. But I, I don't think that they should have been prosecuted at all. Yeah, I, I don't think they should have been prosecuted. I don't think you want to criminalize speech. What I, where I come out is, is on two messages. First of all, disrupting a, a speech and, and preventing a speaker who has been invited to say what he or she came to say is a violation of, of sort of our principles of free speech. You can't do that. But, but I also think the underlying message in the, and, and is, that, um, uh, is that this was the ambassador of Israel who had come to the University of California, Irvine, to give a speech. Um, and for the reasons that these students had, they chose to essentially try and silence an ambassador from another country. It, it, the, again, looking at it through the lens of who is that, it, 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 the question becomes, the question becomes, would any other ambassador be treated the same way? And, and so, that's where the, the question of the denial of legitimacy of the state of Israel comes in and where questions about the demonization of the state of Israel come in. Okay. Okay, another question. From the perspective of a student who develops programs around Palestinian issues, uh, do you think that the hypervigilance we experience on all of our projects can be counted as anti-Muslim prejudice? because there are many different groups who are involved in this. I mean, I think, it, I think the hypervigilance is, is a, a very unfortunate byproduct of this entire thing. If, if the hypervigilance is only directed at, at Muslim students, then absolutely that one could claim that, that, that Muslim uh, uh, students are being um, selected and, and selectively targeted for scrutiny. Um, so if that is indeed the case, absolutely that argument should be made. Okay. Um, so my son, who looks very Jewish, was walking on the outskirts of a quote-unquote checkpoint theater and was dragged down to the ground with a foot on his back and a quote-unquote gun on his head. Politically, he is pro-Israeli who does not support the occupation, yet he feels no alliance with the Palestinian organization because he's been targeted more than once. Um, is this anti-Semitic? I believe that's the right. 
Well, that, that's sort of the debate that, that, that we're having. I mean, what it is is it's, it's, it's incredibly unfortunate. It is, it's, it's incredibly inappropriate that, that someone would be targeted in that fashion. Um, and the question of sort of the manifestation of the anti the anti Israel protest. That's the whole debate that we're having, and so as to that particular incident, and that's that that was again the point of the of the report, and that is you can't take these things in isolation. It's the continuum. It's the it's the entire picture that's being presented. So that's an anecdotal um, uh, incident that it's just tough. Okay. I don't think that's what we've been debating at all. I mean, there's a complete difference between actors acting in a mock checkpoint and assaulting somebody by grabbing them and throwing them to the ground. And that's a completely different, that's the first time I've heard of that story, but that's obviously something that a student cannot engage in and then claim it's free speech. That's physical contact of another person against their will. That's completely wrong, but it's not what we've been debating about. Okay. Um, here's a question. How do we determine the detrimental effects of racism or discrimination in various forms? It seems that there is an elephant in the room that, that, that this is about feelings. But what evidence do we have that harm is done to Jewish students? In a related case, the students who protested at UC Irvine were arrested and prosecuted for their free speech. To me, the effects of such actions are much more detrimental. Uh, and again, the question is, you know, that I've been trying to also push is how do we, who gets to decide whether it's anti-Semitic or not? when someone feels offense. So if you could get back to that. Well, but I, I, I'm not sure that the question is, is whether they're feeling offended because they perceive it to be anti-Semitic, whether they, per, they are offended because the, the and, and again, you're, you're, this is extremely sort of difficult. The point is, is that we do look at the feelings of students in all sorts of contexts. We look at the, at the feelings of, the, um, of all minority students with regard to the messages that are portrayed. The whole dynamic that occurred at, at Compton Cookout at, at, down at UCSD was that it was offensive. And we, the, the UCSD, took action with respect to the offensiveness of those comments. And, and UCSD formed the Climate Council because of the reaction and the feelings of African American students who had to deal with that and deal with a noose in the library. So feelings are at the heart of the way that every single group is looking to be treated on campus. And that's exactly what this is about. So, so again, to try and label why a Jewish student is feeling in a particular way, the Jewish student who's dragged down to the ground, who doesn't politically agree with every single thing that Israel does, his, his feelings or her feelings are about the particular incident in question. But to say that we don't look at the way students feel about things sort of, sort of denies the whole point of this. Islamophobia is is all about it, it, it's all about the projection of Islamophobia should absolutely be combated because of the impact on the psyche of the students who have to hear that message, and that's what we're talking about. Do you want to answer that? Sure. So we can talk about the detrimental effects in terms of. Um, the people whose speech is being curbed, or in terms of the people who feel like they're being selectively treated because of, uh, uh, or selectively scrutinized because they're expressing a particular viewpoint. But I think the way that this discussion has been framed so far has been about the detrimental effects of pro-Palestinian activism on university campuses, on Jewish students. But there's a completely other side to this issue, which is the positive effects of that kind of activism on campus, on all students. And that part, I think, has been neglected. I mean, you have people, you have, there's, a, there's a, a tremendous positive impact from having these different viewpoints on campus for people of all backgrounds. For Jewish students, many Jewish students who I met, it was the first time that they had actually engaged in a discussion with somebody who had a completely opposite view to them about this issue when I was on campus. And they found that to be a very edifying experience. Unsettling, perhaps, uncomfortable, but that's part of going to a university campus is to confront, confront differences and diversity of thought and background and opinion. So I think that you have to look at the positive impact of these kinds of, uh, um, of, the, of the kind of diverse uh, forms of activism on campus. Um, with respect to the uh, UC San Diego incident, I just, I don't think that that is comparable with 
the human rights activism that people are engaging on on campus or the portrayals, these activist portrayals, mock checkpoints, die-ins, what have you, things that are common tactics by people working on all sorts of other issues, whether it's going back to the Vietnam War um, or anti-apartheid or the Darfur issue and whatnot. These are common tactics used by social justice activists. So. I guess my question is, if things are so good, then why are they so bad? Why are we here? And if this is only about activism, and this is only about perpetuating a conversation and, and, and opening people's eyes to this, why are people so mad at each other? And, and so to ignore the, the, the impact that this is having on a particular community or to dismiss it is to essentially perpetuate the problem. And that, I think, is the, the, the why these discussions are, are very important, because that's the gap in this conversation. I mean, I, I, people can be mad for a variety of reasons, but I don't think that that's a good way to measure the value of this speech or the value or the nature of this kind of activism. The Supreme Court has said that a function of free speech under our system of government is to invite dispute it serves its highest purpose when it induces a condition of unrest, creates dissatisfaction with conditions as they are, or even stirs people to anger. Any word spoken, says the Supreme Court, in class, in the lunchroom, or on campus that deviates from views of another person may start an argument or cause a disturbance. But our Constitution says we must take this risk because our history says that it's this sort of hazardous freedom that's the basis of our national strength. So. I just, I don't think that the fact that people get passionate about this issue or are upset about it or mad about it can be a basis for deciding that we don't want this kind of speech it, it, at all on our campuses. But again, that, that, that my focus is not on whether you have a right to do it. The question is, is it healthy for the environment? And if it's not, then you have to ask the question of why. And you simply can't dismiss as, 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 as because then you would have to do the same thing with Islamophobia. You would have to do the same thing with racism towards blacks. You would have to do the same thing in the immigration debate with regard to the Latino community. You know, you could bring on all sorts of things that, that could truly offend. And there are all sorts of messages about the, those particular um, issues that are incredibly offensive. And I think you would have be absolutely in your right to say to the person who, to, to take issue with the person who simply dismisses it, oh, we're just trying to start a conversation. We're just trying to advance understanding. I'm just trying to make you feel, or make you understand why. And I'm trying to open the eyes of African American students by discounting the impact of slavery or by talking about the fact that they are entitled to civil rights. Th this is evidence of what the problem is. And to just simply dismiss it as, well, this is just a discussion and people are upset, and, but I think that's why there's the problem. And, the, and what I think we need to start doing is we need to start listening to each other. I'm not dismissing it, I'm, but what I am saying is that first, there's a difference between the examples that you've listed and the kind of speech that is going on on campuses about Palestinian human rights advocacy. You're equating all of that advocacy with hate speech, which is extremely problematic, simply because it offends some people uh, on campus. But it offends Second, them enough. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll finish. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Second, what I hear when, I, when, when we talk about these notions of comfort and harmony and civility on campus is really an argument that ultimately will always privilege the status quo because it's people who feel marginalized on campus that will feel the need to speak and the other, peop other people on campus who don't feel that way, who feel like they're, uh, they're being challenged in some way are the ones who are gonna want that debate to end. And this is just common to every single social justice struggle in United States history, whether it's the civil rights movement, white students in the South, not all of them, but those who supported the system of American apartheid in that day, were not very happy about what civil rights activists were doing in sit-ins or on their campuses. And so I, I just, I don't think that you can always go back to the question of how people feel about this issue and identify that as a starting point of a problem. But we're talking about how a political debate is playing out on campuses and it's unnatural, I think, to ask that that political debate end when the reasons for that political debate, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the Israeli occupation are ongoing. So long as that's ongoing, people on university campuses and around the world are going to be arguing about it. Okay. Let me put one more question and then I'm gonna give you closing comments, okay? Right. <laughs> um, 
While there is a BDS movement that may be anti-Israel and J Street as a pro-Israel organization opposes that movement, and this is again kind of people arguing kind of specifics, J Street has underlined never labeled it anti-Semitic. Many in J Street support targeted boycotts. Uh, the question is, there are many Haredim, uh, no, uh, or ultra-Orthodox Jews living in Israel and the rest of the world who are anti-Zionist. Does that mean that they are anti-Semitic as well? Well, the, the, the Haredim, um, the source of their anti-Zionism is different than the source of, of anti-Zionism anti in other contexts. The Haredim's anti-Zionism is tied up with a religious belief with regard to how Israel should be, should be resettled. Um, so I don't see it as, as anti-Semitic. Um, and I mean, that's, that's, that's all I can tell you. The implication to me from that statement is that other forms of anti-Zionism are based in irrational hatred and not a reaction to a history of dispossession and a history of how the Palestinian people have been treated. And that's what I see as the, a lack of acknowledgement here of what Palestinians have been subjected to in the past 60 years. And that there are very good reasons for the people who have undergone the experience that Palestinians have gone to oppose the way the state ideology of Israel as it exists today and I think that that lack of recognizing the meritorious arguments for opposing current Israeli policies or opposing the current ideology of the state of Israel, the lack of acknowledging those is what's opening the door to caricaturing everybody who engages in this kind of activism as being motivated by nothing more than bigotry. And that's what I think is the crucial error in not only this debate, but also the Campus Climate Reports and House Resolution 35. Okay. One more question about college sponsorship. Uh, in about 2009, Cowell College canceled a scheduled program featuring an Israeli and a Palestinian uh, who were to tell their experiences of the Israel occupation of East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Uh, was the college sponsorship withdrawn because the college assumed these reports of, uh, assumed these reports of experiences were anti-Semitic? That I couldn't answer. Um, but. The following question is, is this what the university should do, prejudge what will be said? And again, this gets to the question of balance and how to respond to an event that may be one-sided or the other. Yeah, I mean, the, the university looks at the messages of its programs all the time. And it is a legitimate inquiry because of the position that the university stands in with respect to its students. And so it, you may disagree, and I have no idea why the college canceled it. And I would probably disagree with their cancellation of, of this. But having said that, you can't look at this sponsorship just in a vacuum with respect to this particular issue because we know that the, that the university will not sponsor certain types of speech, certain, certain groups, certain messages that come on. We just know that they won't. Okay. So Yeah, maybe this I'm, was because I have a you know, I find myself in this position often um, in terms of being asked to sponsor or co-sponsor events. And, um, you know, for those of us, again, who try to kind of, who, th who think about these issues, does that require that, you know, if someone were invited to speak, that we need to uh, get a copy of their speech beforehand? No, or that, no. but, you but again- You didn't ask me for mine. Right, no, I didn't <laughs> ask you for yours or either one of you, but, <laughs> Um, because often, you know, we find ourselves in sponsoring events not knowing exactly what is going, you know, how it will be perceived, even if we've seen a film, or knowing what someone's going to say, or, and so for those of us kind of in this business of, you know, academic programming, um, the question of sponsorship, you know, that, that it seems to assume that we, you know, have an idea of what's going to be discussed. Well, or well but no, but I mean, look, there there are people who you know what their messages are. I mean, I, I assume that you're not asking people on a random basis to come on. You're 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 inviting them because of the particular message that they have, or a particular subject that they can discuss, or because of some expertise that they might have. Mm -hmm. So I'm I, I I'm I think we're between you know sort of this random aspect to it and or sort of the, the, the notion that you have to read every, every word of what they're gonna say. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so that's where I think the, the problem comes in. And I, as I keep saying, I think it's very clear that there are certain messages that the university would not sponsor because it would offend particular groups, et cetera. So. 
Now, I'm not saying that it's rightly applied in this or mm -hmm. wrongly applied. No, I, I am saying that, 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 it's, that, that that's very clearly a line that is out there, and the university works very hard, I think, at trying to make sure that the, that the experience that their students have is one where it fosters as much communication as possible. I think that's where the bias should be, as much as possible. But it's clear that messages that of, of offense, messages of prejudice, messages of uh, messages of bigotry that the university would shy away from sponsoring those. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to give each of you a few minutes to kind of wrap things up, and in your comments, feel free to say what you'd like. But also, you know, you both are familiar with what's been happening on campuses and in the university in general. Uh, we are in the midst of students engaging in discussion about a divestment proposal right now, and so uh, if you could kind of perhaps kind of things to think about moving forward. I'm not saying that we can agree, but um, how to necessarily kind of approach this in, in your summary statements. So. I mean, honestly, what the, uh, first of all, I mean, I want to thank you for inviting us to do this. I mean, this, this is not an easy thing to do. If anybody of you wants to come up here and take the microphone, um, <laughs> I can tell you, um, it, is, it is a very, very complicated issue. And, but my, my biggest hope is that people start listening to one another. And, and, and I think that, that what I really hope for is, yes, vibrant discussion, all sorts of viewpoints. Um, but let's also be clear that, that to the extent that there are groups that are offended by those messages, that some exploration of why they are offended has to take place. And I think that the best thing that can happen going forward with respect to campus climate on the UC campuses is that we sort of break down these barriers that have developed with respect to this dialogue. And while, yes, there is anecdotal and individual contact, I will tell you that my daughter was the president of Bruins for Israel. And, um, and I can tell you both the, the wonderful stories that she can share about reaching out to members of SJP, people that she still considers her friends, and also the difficulty that she had in that position because of the messages that she received, and the difficulties that we helped her go through during the period of, of Justice in Palestine Week at UCLA, and, and some of the, those struggles. So I think what we need to do is recognize that we're all here tonight because there is a problem, and what we should be doing is solving that problem by starting to listen to one another and bringing and facilitating discussion that br raises this up and, and provides an understanding of these notions of anti-Semitism and, and, and where all of that leads. I hope this is a good um, start for that process. I wish this campus a tremendous amount of, 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 of peace and, and, and reconciliation because I really think it's needed. I agree that there is a problem, but I think that the problem is the gross mischaracterization of what's happening on university campuses and of the motives of the students who are involved in this kind of activism. I don't think you should trust me. I don't think you should take my word for it. I think that you are students at a public university that are fully capable of going out there and talking with your fellow students on whatever side of the issue that they're on and drawing your own conclusions. You're also fully capable of downloading and reading campus climate reports, House Resolution 35, all the literature that's been produced about this debate and coming to your own conclusions. You have access to huge libraries, huge online databases, and with that you have a responsibility to actually do what you need to do to figure out what's going on in the world and what's going on in your campuses and what's going on in the UC system and come to your own conclusions. I've presented you with my thoughts based on my personal experience as a student activist at UC Berkeley who worked on this issue and also as somebody who's read all, a lot of this stuff. So I hope that with that you will take this uh, as an invitation to do your own research, pursue your own facts, and come to your own conclusions rather than just arbitrarily side with one person or another based on your pre-existing biases. Okay, thank you. And before uh, we let our speakers go, um, I also want to thank all of you for being here um, and also for people on this campus um, to remind uh, everyone that the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights has been holding on to a complaint that was filed years ago as well as from other campuses as well and we spoke about this before and um, the fact wh whatever whether you agree with the complaint disagree with the complaint that's not my point my point is that 
we have been given no guidance from the federal government precisely about some of these issues, right? Because the, the, the civil rights complaint basically argues that uh, there has, that some of what's going on on campus amounts to institutional discrimination against Jewish students and, and refers to these issues of campus climate. And again, regardless of what side you are on in these cases, and this wasn't about that, but we are, you know, many of us on campuses are waiting for an interpretation, if you will, about how to view these issues um, from the federal government that has not happened. Um, and our administration is kind of waiting and we're all waiting and it's, you know, I, I personally feel that it's kind of left us kind of in the, you know, on our, in our, we have to rely on our own devices waiting for a legal decision from on high. Uh, the ramifications are that if we're found not in compliance that, you know, we risk uh, losing federal funding, so the stakes are large, but in general, given that these issues are so important, uh, we have these pending cases that hopefully, hopefully, we will finally get some resolution about. Um, again, I want to, these are very difficult issues. I and many of you have been involved in them for many years. Uh, we thought it was important to at least begin the discussion. Uh, again, our goal was not necessarily to get agreement, but to show that we can air the complexities of these issues and that people with different points of view can talk to each other across a table, even if they come with to very different conclusions. I only hope that the modeling that kind of behavior will filter out through other conversations on our campus. We'll continue in the discussions that have been happening within our student government that began on Tuesday, now that this resolution is already in, we'll continue in the coming weeks as these discussions happen. And I hope that other departments and colleges will take the mantle to continue bringing these kind of speakers forward. I've gotten recommendations from both people about other people we may want to bring to campus to talk particularly about the issues in the Middle East, but also about issues of free speech uh, related to this issue. This is just the beginning, but I really want to thank our speakers. Join me in thanking them for coming and sharing their thoughts. So I also want to thank the audience for being uh, a respectful audience and for sitting through this so attentively. Yeah.